welcome everybody uh, for this meeting of the Technology, Economics, and Governance uh, Working Group, which Amy is up there on the left-hand side. We can see you just find Amy and I uh, co-chairing with great help from Drew, and we're happy to have Drew Endy with us today. Alex, sorry. Thanks so much, John. And thank you, Amy, as well, Alex, for your help. I really appreciate the invitation and the good advice and counsel in advance. I also grateful for each of you for joining together from government, from industry, friends and colleagues uh, from Boston, and Berkeley. Um, synthesis in the uh, oldest form of the word is, is you know, in Greek is about composition and putting together. And so synthetic biology in a way represents a, a new perspective with respect to living systems. How do we think about relating to them as we put and piece them together, life itself. And um, I still feel like I'm a beginner in this domain, even though I've been laboring in it for 20 plus years because it's a frontier that just keeps unfurling. Um, my hope in coming today, among other things, is that each of us leaves unsatisfied. The work is far from done and many things are up for grabs, yet energized to work together in new ways, all hands. I do think that this decade, without a doubt, the third decade of modern synthetic biology is the decade in which things come together or not or the stuff we care about or otherwise. So, so in other words, it's go time. And, and as much as the science and technology is absolutely essential, what will make it work is everything else, the culture and the politics and the economics and the anthropology and the structure of the narrative and the security strategies and so on. And so, and so it's the nerd rapture hiding inside of all of this but that by itself will, will be stillborn and never appear. And so I'm not trying to make too much of it, but, but please consider this an open invitation with some desperation to join in and help figure it out. There's a really neat thing happening on campus, and I won't belabor it, but I'll just postcard a website. If you've heard of artificial intelligence, you can go to ai.stanford.edu. Now that you've heard of synthetic biology, you can go to sb.stanford.edu. And if you go there, you'll see 50 or so faculty starting to come together from across the campus as we're getting organized to bring synthesis forward as a theme, integrating our entire university. I'm very grateful to Jennifer Cochran, my colleague and chair of bioengineering is here. She's serving on the bioleadership task force for the university as this is unfurling. So, so I, I wanted to open with reflections that aren't meant to close today, but to invite you to consider what's going on in possibilities. My, my opening remarks, which go maybe 20 minutes, are focused on the next thousand days to 3,000 days. So three years to 10 years. That's the window of time I'm, I'm sort of navigating and living with. And, and so the, these reflective questions are, is there anything new here? Um, if there is, is the change likely to be incremental or discontinuous in some way? If there is change, regardless of type, are there strategic opportunities? What are they and, and could they benefit democracies? And if so, then what do we do about it? How do we get to multilateral flourishing if, if that's where this ends up? Well, these are not the only questions you can ask, but the reflective questions I just kind of want to give everyone to take away. And I'll, I'll try and <coughs> give you idiosyncratic answers to this, not the consensus or average answer, but how I see it. So I want to start with, with something that might be as close to the conventional. Um, this is a cartoon schematic of, of Baker's yeast. Baker's yeast normally takes in glucose or sugar and makes beer or wine, ethanol. So it does some metabolism that converts the sugar into an alcohol. The cartoon of the Baker's yeast on the left here, all of this biochemistry is bioengineered by a colleague and my partner, Christina Smolke, so I'm biased, but all the chemistry here is, is, is made via synthetic biology. And by doing this chemistry, implementing 30 or so different enzymes in yeast, the baker's yeast that would normally make ethanol is instead going to take glucose and make a molecule called scopolamine. Scopolamine is an is a active pharmaceutical ingredient found normally in nightshade plants and can be used in motion sickness patches. Um, and so that's what's coming out on the bottom right. So we're very familiar with the idea that biology can synthesize things. So I want to give you this current example and then link it back to synthetic biology. Next slide, please. On the left is an earlier example of doing this. This is from a, a, a past colleague and friend, Jay Kiesling at Berkeley, and a paper published in 2006. And then this earlier work, Jay and his team are adding three new enzymes to yeast 
to make a chemical called artemisinic acid, which is a precursor to the antimalarial compound, artemisinin. That took them about 100 postdoc years of expert labor to carry out that project, about a $25 million R&D project. The example I just introduced you to from the Smoky Lab at Stanford, you can see the paper published in 2020, 14 years later. There's only two authors on that paper. The first author is a graduate student in, bio, in chemical engineering, I think, working in a bioengineering lab. And in one graduate student year, they're implementing a 30 enzyme pathway. So what's happening is under the hood, there's a transition in the workflow. How engineers are working with biology to synthesize things is somehow changing. We're going from complicated to manage projects to single person projects. Next slide, please. How come this is happening? If you go back and look at the ideas coming from the biology and engineering communities represented in the DARPA synthetic biology study circa 20 years ago, the big ideas were not super profound. They're old ideas. Let's take a workflow and we're going to decouple the steps in the workflow so you can get disaggregated workflows. Let's develop abstraction as a tool for managing complexity, long established for electronics and programming, but not yet well developed for biology. And let's see if we can develop just some standards that would enable coordination of labor. And so when you look at the text in that paper from 2020, you can see evidence of this changed workflow. We designed a biosynthetic pathway with five modules meant to be reusable. There are the modules to the modules they actually already made. So the guy could just take them off the shelf and reuse them with a little bit of tweaking. Amazing in biology, not amazing in mature engineering. Um, next, um, gene sequences were synthesized. It used to be, Jason, when you were a beginning PhD student, you had to go into the lab at MIT and like manually bash the DNA to get the DNA you want to do the experiment that you want. The, the graduate students now have the option of ordering through a computer interface to a company that just prints the DNA and gives them the DNA. That's a disaggregated workflow. So, so that's why this transformation is changing. It's, it's under the hood. And I, I, I want to highlight that because oftentimes each of us is under so much stress and, and demand to solve a problem right away with an application that it's harder to see improvements in workflow and process. But at the essence, that, I think that's the essence of the engineering side of synthetic biology, the research to upgrade the workflow. Again, these aren't new ideas. Look at this aqueduct in Segovia, Spain, 2,000 years old. There's standards, there's abstraction, there's disaggregated workflows to make this artifact, a collective artifact. Next slide. Okay, I want to give you another uh, postcard. How did SARS-CoV-2 um, first get to Switzerland? We can look at the public data in the health records and we can see that the first case appears over the Italian border and presents on the 25th of February of 2020. That's not when the virus was first active in Switzerland. It turns out that researchers in Shanghai had sequenced the pathogen, transmitted over the internet. Researchers in the Swiss capital downloaded the information, resynthesized the DNA template from scratch, uh, then transcribed that to make a messenger RNA template, infected cells in the laboratory, recovered live virus. And they did all of that by the uh, 13th of February, 2020, almost two weeks before the pandemic arrived by airplane and travel. The internet plus synthetic biology got SARS-CoV-2 to the Swiss capital before the pandemic. Did. Is that good or bad should be an obvious question. The, the significance here is, is just to show that you can move biology around as bits. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's all I'm trying to, to trigger and get in your mind. Next. Um, obviously, this is using synthesis of DNA. Um, the example I'm showing here with pictures is from 1980. Uh, the technology for synthesizing DNA, I would say, is still very immature, but improving. So when I first started teaching 20 years ago, if I wanted to build a piece of DNA from scratch, every time I add a letter, it cost me about $4. And now it's about $0.04. Cents. Um, so about a hundredfold reduction over 20 years in price. Um, less improvements, I would say, in turn time and other characteristics. It's still very immature technology. Uh, Jason, I'm curious what your sense of this is, but my rough estimate is Maybe over the last 20 years, about 2 billion US dollars have been invested at getting better at building DNA, which is a, a big number, yet at the same time for the stuff of life, it's not a very big number. We fail to organize um, uh, how to structure capital to sustain significant improvements in DNA fat. Next slide. Um, so 
One of the takeaways here is that synthetic biology relaxes this constraint on all of natural biology, which is the constraint of direct descent. We all come from our parents and, and literally physically descend from our parents. But if I can go from atoms to bits and then bits to atoms, I can reinstantiate biology to the extent this becomes technically possible in new ways and new places. And this lets biology access the fundamental superpower of the internet, which is to disconnect information from a position in space time and move it around. But what happens when that internet superpower combines with biology? We don't really know yet, but it's unfolding right in front of us. Next slide. So let me, let me give you a, the way I think about this. Um, biology is very different than what I'm familiar with, which is mostly existing within an industrial economy that benefits from centralized manufacturing and supply chains. Um, biology in its limit naturally is the opposite of that. The leaves on a tree don't come from a factory and then get shipped to where the tree is gonna be and taped and stapled to the twigs and branches. Uh -huh. The photons and molecules arrive where the biology is gonna grow, then the biology grows locally. And so at the limit, biology is the ultimate in terms of distributed manufacturing. It does it fabulously well naturally. Uh, we're less well experienced with doing it uh, in this modern form. I think about the internet being motivated in part by comms resilience. And now I'm wondering about a bionet um, enabled by manufacturing resilience. If we take the example of, of brewing of essential medicines, Instead of having a poppy field or a nightshade field in Australia or Tasmania and shipping the materials to formulate into pills wherever the pills are needed, imagine, imagine having a simple you know, brewery operating where you need it, fed with sugar, however you source it. And so you could have supply chains that are deglobalized. I think it starts with industrial manufacturing of drop-in replacements for stuff we could make with biology, but we can imagine pushing it much further than just mere supply chain upgrades. What is it going to do to uh, medicine what the internet's already done to music and, and geek videos? It could, right? And, and it, it'd be interesting to get Mark Cuban's read on that, given what he's trying to. There's a fine article about deglobalization. Um, it, it comes to a conclusion I find strange, which is technology will have little impact on globalization, deglobalization. Because from my perspective, biology is going to have a significant opening of opportunity in support of deglobalization. Um, so not to pick at the article or author, but just to say, really use some help in, in, in trying to sort through how to think about this. Um, if we disentangle supply chains, does that lead to political instability in certain cases? Or, or how should we develop these transitions to whatever advantage we like? I also want to offer a, a note of caution. And, and David uh, Graywall, thank you for this, this pointer. Um, it is very difficult to talk about frontier technologies in Washington publicly, let alone a technology like synthetic biology that's got the word sin right in the first syllable. It's just tricky, <clears throat> okay? And because of that, it turns out that it's much easier to talk about things like bioeconomy, which is a good and important thing. We need a flourishing bioeconomy. But when we adopt the mindset of talking about a frontier technology only through the lens of economy, we risk adopting a sort of incrementalism where we're managing for incremental growth, 3% this year, 4% the next year, not very much is changing. And I'm not against that, but it reminds me a little bit of, of, of like trying to imagine the year 1972, 50 years ago, and we're talking about the information economy and how important it's gonna be. And we just wanna manage it for incremental growth at the very moment that packet switching is, is becoming interesting and the personal is about to happen for computing. And so just wanna flag that, possibility. Um, again, not to, not to just, I don't want to cede everything to the economists. We just need a lot, we need a lot more together thinking on this. Next slide. So here are some wild cards. These are the things, these are the sorts of things that are coming from the students, right? the people younger than us, right? Um, they're imagining a biology that's, that's personal, not in the context of personalized medicine per se, but just like personal. You have the biotechnology. Um, what's salmonella? You think of it as a pathogen because it is, but Roy Curtis III and others have long been developing salmonella as a platform for delivering a fully biological vaccine platform. So you would simply ingest salmonella and it would deliver to your body the DNA vaccine. 
how much easier might it be to make a trillion doses of salmonella as compared to a synthetic RNA vaccine that's not fully biological because it's packaged in lipids and it needs plastic and steel to be injected? I was like, what does a fully biotic technology look like? Another example, think like, what's a sinus infection? If you ask the undergrads working in the Stanford Genetic Engineering Olympics team, the iGEM team, they couldn't work on campus because of a pandemic. They're working in the community bio lab down in Mountain View. They're trying to develop microbes that live in the sinuses as persistent surveillance organisms that tell them what infection they have. Um, if they have no infection, their mucus is normal colored. If they have an influenza infection, their mucus becomes bright orange. If they uh, have a coronavirus infection, their mucus becomes bright purple. Right now, how far did they take that project as teenagers? Um, they were able to show that the naturally competent microbes can take up DNA from the environment at levels that are clinically relevant. Um, they were able to talk to Quest Diagnostics and confirm that Quest would never do this R&D project because <laughs> right, it's not in their current wheelhouse. And then they got a $45,000 grant from the hospital to further develop the project, right? And file an initial provisional patent and see where it could go. And then they went back to being juniors. Right. Next slide. Let me just keep pushing this. Um, could you make, we, most of biotechnology now moves out and it's industrial and big for manners, right? Could you push it in the opposite direction? Since we're so close to Menlo Park where the personal computer arises, could you make a personal biomaker, a box? It could be municipal or maybe it's local or maybe it's on your desk. It takes in electricity and data and air and outcomes with the biology could be programmed. At the limit, this becomes a design anywhere, grow everywhere system as opposed to design in California made in China, distributed. Okay, next. This becomes even more interesting because of how technologies are coming together. And I just wanna highlight one in particular. I call this electrobiosynthesis. You can take electricity, however it's developed, generated, and use that to split water and use that to fix carbon from the air make single carbon organic molecules such as formate. Bioengineers have figured out how to re-engineer metabolism so microbes grow on formate instead of glucose. It's very immature right now, but if you put those two things together, go from a kilowatt hour of electricity to a gram of biomass. And it looks like at the limit, we should be able to get about 30 grams of biomass from a kilowatt hour of electricity. This is very interesting to me because of what's going on with energy, especially with the sustainable energy systems and the fact that we have effective return on energy for systems that are above one. It means that we're transitioning to electricity generation, abundant civilization for the first time. What this means from a bio context is now the ceiling on what biology can make is not capped by 90 terawatts of natural photosynthesis. Rather, it's just wherever you, you can generate electricity, whatever that ceiling is, including places where you can't grow crops. The other thing is, push the limits um, and then I'll sort of transition back and, and wrap my, my open. You know, we watch uh, Mandalorian on Disney Plus. We've got two young kids at home. And when we stream that content, I really don't want to download a research project. I want to download content that works, that's reliable. And so if I'm imagining a future bionet where if somebody over there who needs a medicine, right, or needs to grow a material or some solution, they're not going to want to download a research project big biowork studio like what Jason and his team has, that feels like a movie production lot. And they've got to ship biocode as content that's downloadable and works reliably, whatever the local context is. We are on average very far away from that technically because of our fundamental ignorance underlying our knowledge of how cells operate. There is no natural cell on earth that's completely understood. Even the best studied cells still have about 20% of their essential genes and nobody knows what they do. And so what that leads to is very interesting practice and metaphor. For example, if we get a cell to do something useful, the word we might use is, oh, I hijacked the machinery of the cell, solve the problem. Hijack the cell? So what does that mean is like fancy bioengineering professors, we're trained in hijackers, cellular hijackers. I don't wanna do that. We'd much rather train captains of cells. Now, what's that going to take? Well, probably means we're going to have to learn how to build cells, right? And then we can operate them, teach others how to operate them. If we could pull that off, then there's a chance you could download and go. So what I'm showing here is unpublished work from uh, graduate students in bioengineering and electrical engineering working with the National Lab. 
uh, for six years or so, they've been laboring to contribute to the building of cells from scratch. This object on the top left is a cryo-electron microscope image of a precursor cell about 400 nanometers across that we built from scratch by mixing simple chemicals that have all been predefined and purified. And the image on the bottom left that's rotating is the computer rendering of that microscopy data. You can see a lipid bilayer and some internal membranes. And then the red dots are ribosomes uh, that make proteins and everything else has been removed. The object we built is capable of expressing any DNA we add to the object. And so the work we've been doing is to add DNA to the object to see if it could remake itself in a von Neumann-like sense. What DNA do we add to the object to get it to grow and divide again? And most importantly, we figured out now, six years in, how to debug that problem. And so what I can represent to you is the students leaving the lab today, graduating, feel like they could build a cell in about a thousand days. It's not an academic research project. It's probably too early for a commercial project. It's one of these public benefit focused research type projects that's a 50 to $100 million scale project. Why does this matter? I think of it much like the 1960s and the space program and leaving the gravity well of the earth and, and seeing what's out there beyond the constraints of our gravity well. Uh, I think of this like there's a life well here too, next slide. Meaning all the life on earth is constrained by all the life on earth that's come before. We are constrained by lineage. We are constrained by the requirement of needing to physically reproduce. And because the physical environment changes, we're also constrained by the requirement of needing to be able to evolve over evolutionary timescales. The person on the left, um, Parker Wilson, is my maternal great-grandfather, uh, circa 1890 in Washington County, Pennsylvania, uh, growing up and living on a farm, playing the fiddle, um, which we still have, and then that's me. And, and so we're, we're familiar with the constraints of lineage. What's so interesting about synthesis, it just removes these constraints potentially and getting up out of this life well, it doesn't leave us in the deep space vacuum. It's like, oh no, this is, this is now the precipice of all the things biology could be, most of which we haven't imagined yet. Right? But, but I, 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 even though it's not broadcast like the 60s was with space, I think the 2020s will see humanity climb and crawl up out of our life well. And I, we, I know that's a strange word. I'm probably the only person using that word, but just go for it. All right, nice. Um, now, now, wait a minute, <laughs> uh, just to sort of close and land this for, for discussion. You know, as, as bioengineers, we work on tools of mass construction, not WMDs, TMCs, right? Um, and so we want to cure disease and save the environment and understand life and enable flourishing. And we want to, it's so hard, we want to make it easier. Right? And there's an amazing Chobani yogurt commercial about what this future might be, solar punk, happy tech, it's all working. And it's very Rousseauian and naively optimistic. Um, and so I want to acknowledge, um, you know, the fact that there's other political traditions which are totally valid, uh, the Hobbesian and, and what have you, right? So, so it's, it's very appropriate to react to everything I'm saying and interpret, the, interpret what I'm saying is he wants to, he doesn't know, he's naive, he wants to create disease, he wants to destroy environments, he wants to devalue life, enable extinctions. The only thing that's the same is that we'll all agree I want to make doing it easier, right? <laughs> and so it's so just sort of like, that, that's part of what's going on here. And both, both perspectives are really valid because it's real. Next. So I just wanted to flag that and, and Amy respond to some of your really helpful comments um, in advance. You know, here's a letter from the 5th of August, right? So, so what's that, 13 days ago, this is coming out of Geneva, and the Russian Federation has accused the United States of America of operating an offensive bioweapons program in Ukraine. So they're triggering Article 5 of the BWC, and the meetings are being set up for next month. And uh, um, uh, who's leading it? The, the, uh, the chaired by the ambassador of Hungary. Um, so, huh. Um, we've got issues on the Hobbesian side. Offensive bioweapons programs. In the 1970s, Nixon, right, reason was used to stand down the public offensive bioweapons program in the US. We've got to avoid, Megan's been A plus on this consistently, got to avoid naively remilitarizing biotechnology at the nation state level. Um, we've got bioterror, we've lived that. Um, we've got bio error and scare. I'll come back to those. Amy, the thing that makes me the most nervous, honestly, that I'm truly the most concerned about is bio war. 
I can I can be freaked out about all the other ones, but I am very concerned about naively stumbling into a remilitarization of biotech with the tools we've got in our coming. So, so I just want to respond to your prompt and, and leave that flag. I'm trying not to get into a discussion of particular examples because that's a pit of infinite despair and it's not, anyway, we might actually share this video. Um, I also want to flag, I, I, I also want to flag, right, that there's issues of, of public health, but also political health, that these actions, these Hobbesian actions, these malintentioned actions can attack political health. It's much easier to do that, as we all know. Um, the other thing is, you know, it's like a few people in the 20th century thought about biology as a source of power. Um, is, is your country an emerging or world leading or declining biopower? Where does the US fall in that? Um, and then of course, we have fake news. We know there's misinformation in bio. We might as well use the hashtag fake bio, right? Because we've got it, we don't know how to deal with it. Right, slide. So um, one of the ways I can get out of this is to, is to explore asking better questions. And I really appreciated this op-ed from Secretary Schultz. Um, when trust is in the room, then good things are possible. Otherwise, forget it. So what are better questions than questions? I can't, I, I bet we've all been asked the question. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked the question by members. Uh, like, where did, where did, what do you think about the lab? Where did SARS come from? And, and the most useful response I've got is, why have we implemented a system of governance that makes it hard to answer that question? Because that's what we've done. We've, we have options. We have other ways of governing this, this science and technology. Yet we've chosen to implement a system that makes it harder to know. Another better question, following up on Secretary Schultz's editorial, is like, how can we create a new and further sustain biotrust? How does that work? We saw in part the collapse of inspections in the BWC because nation states were accused of, not inappropriately, of, of doing industrial espionage in the name of multilateral inspections. Mm -hmm. right? But we have other ways of doing audits and inspections that don't involve nation's parties. Right? Maybe we should adopt some private sector solutions to establishing trust. Again, just an opportunity to think about. Next slide. Um, so to wrap this up, I wanna offer an alternate approach or a complementary approach. So let's, <laughs> let's go over to PRC. Um, you can see the framing for um, how economic and social development is, is happening there. See, I see your hand, Herb. Let, let me land this and then we'll, we'll take that. Um, complete domestic circulation. Uh, Develop capacities such that you can create leverage uh, upon others, <coughs> dependencies in terms of supply chains from other for other nations. Uh, link uh, life sciences with computing, AI, SB, come together, two sides of the same coin. Um, interact with nature better. And then public health system, it's very interesting. Bottom up distributed detection, warning, and response is, is, is hard coded right in that writing there. So these are Chinese statements about what? They're going to do yeah, this is a this is a from, directly from this article just download it it's still up you should be able to read it next slide um, so we come to synthetic biology um it's 10 years old but it covers the period of time out to 2032 so i thought i'd share it we had the ministry of science and technology come to washington and present their 20-year roadmap for sb here it is and 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 and, in, and i'll just note that they're hitting their targets 10 years in right so so the 20-year one I'll, I'll just double down on the last bullet point, creation of artificial life, the construction of a simple cell from scratch. Um, so whether I'm right and it can be done by or before 2025 or they're right, it's between 2025 and 2032. So that's an interesting time. We just happen to be around in that time. If somebody goes and does that. Next. So brute force is gonna to be tough going. Instead, I would offer let's be smarter and wiser to the extent we can. And, and most of what's happening, I think, right now can be represented by what's on the bottom left of this slide. We think of this as an emerging technology, a la Moore's law, and we've got to keep up with the other because if we slip behind on an exponential trend, it's harder to catch up. And so that creates the urgency of staying at the frontier. But David did a very good job of teaching me about the power of networks. And to the extent that the internet is coming for biotechnology, that we're getting networked biotechnology, then we have to think strategically beyond Moore's law and exponentials and adopt potentially network strategies that result in entrenched coordination solutions. You go there for the answer. It's very hard to displace that. 
And so Metcalf and Joy and theirs laws, the power of a network is the square of connected actors on the network, or how do you benefit from the labor of others even if they don't work for you, is Joy's law. Those sorts of things are ramifying in the biospace for the first time. If, if we miss on those, it's not really a catch up, it's just like you missed. Right? So, so we have the normal urgency of keeping up on an exponential, but then I think we have the extra urgency of coordination solutions lurking. Most of what we're doing right now, strategically and nationally, I would say is, is like status quo industrial mindset in s and in both, both domestic manufacturing capacity. So I think everything up above is greenfield opportunity for investment. And I wanna highlight that the right side of the slide isn't perfect, but, but there's another dimension to this obviously, because it's biology. So there's the cultural and ethical and societal aspects of all of this, which end up being more limiting and gating. And so I wanted to give some examples of, of how other people are thinking about relationships with living systems, not to solve problems, but to be good partners and stewards with the earth. Um, the genetic engineering Olympics you mentioned that I helped start with colleagues, that's an image of what that looks like. That's the Heinz Convention Center in Boston. What happens when 5,000 teenagers from all over the world come together to share their happy tech bio, right? And then go back, right? And, and to the extent that we're giving them cultural norms in addition to the technologies and updating that annually, like that creates a soft power, that creates a set of relationships, that creates all sorts of opportunities. Do we embrace and engage with those and support that or just let it go by? Hopefully the former, next. So I wanted to show this in a different way. When we talk about bioeconomy in the US, that's fabulous. Commercial activity, according to Stuart Brand, is only one of six layers of what makes a healthy civilization. And if you go to the SB website for Stanford, you can see this enumerated in a lot more detail. But I, I just wanna flag so many interesting opportunities beyond infrastructure and commerce and governance down at the culture layer and the nature layer and, and doing the work to basically lead our... If you were an alien historian looking at the earth and you observe the period of time from 1950 to 2050, in 1950, these creatures, these homo sapiens don't even understand the structure of DNA. And by 2050, we're gonna be able to build cells and operate them. And so this hundred year period is the biotic tra 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 transition, right? For our civilization. And whoever figured out how to lead that culturally and practically, right? In addition, it's powered by SNT, but it's led by culture and practice. You know, that, that's what this slide is about. Okay, so to close, um, is there anything new here? I would argue yes. Um, 20 million people were saved last year by synthetic RNA vaccines, built by synthetic DNA. Um, incremental change only, nope, there's discontinuities. Network is coming and yeah, it manifests through drop-in replacements and in industrial supply chains initially, but it promises to make biotech personal and local. Are there strategic opportunities? I think so mostly arising via network power and the opportunity for cultural leadership. Could it uniquely benefit democracies? Yes, in part because it's the ultimate distributed manufacturing platform and is a way, you know, like the ultimate sponge and counterbalance to authoritarianism. And if you can enable people to have optionality locally, they can be citizens locally. There's a lot of, lot of long political theory thinking on that that should be explored in this context. So, so in other words, I think biology is democracies unique natural partner if, if, we, if we develop it as a technology correctly. The, the, the counter to that is democracies are uniquely vulnerable to pandemics because they attack all people. And in a liberal democracy, that's not so great in bringing everybody together. It's easy to attack all people. Um, all right, what's needed to make this real? Strategies, not just one strategy. Biology is way too important. So we should have more than one strategy. We should have bets and hedges um, publicly. Um, and then mastering the cell, building and securing the bionet and leading the society. Probably too much for an open, but now you got the, the core dump on ramp and I'm, I'm grateful for the conversation to come. I think we should ask if Amy has any opening questions. Amy, I do refer to you a few times. So. Well, let me just say thank you, Drew, for this terrific talk and for engaging with this really important issue. I know we've been going back and forth about this for a while. I'm delighted to see you here and that you can see the interest in our community about what you have to say. So I'd like to ask you a little bit, Drew, about organizations. So you talked about the 
the importance of organizations, the importance of politics. Can you lay out for us um, the organizational ecosystem today in Synthetic Bio, and in particular sort of three cuts, um, the geography of synthetic biology, where are the points of real, where, where are the advances coming from? Obviously here at Stanford, you've talked about China, but where's the locus of activity geographically? Number two, by sector. So is this really where universities are leading? Is the private sector leading? Help us understand that piece. And then government, who in the US government is responsible for this area? And how do you see those dynamics playing out as we think about policy for synthetic bio moving forward? Thanks, Amy. Those are great questions. And I want to invite, uh, I'll do my best to respond, but I want to invite Jason from Ginkgo Bioworks and Megan and others who want to chime in, but let me, let me take a first cut. Um, these ideas originate in the United States, frankly, over the last 20 years. The, the science of synthetic biology is, is well entrenched within the U.S. university system, but languishing in, in interesting ways. I don't, I don't want to belabor it. Synthetic biology is also very well established in Europe. The Max Planck societies, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, Minister Willits made it a priority for the UK under the Blair government. Um, the Dutch have an incredible build a cell program as an national initiative. Um, so I would say Europe is actually ahead of the United States on the basic science of SB. Um, not that the US is very far behind, but, but it, it wouldn't take for granted that we're in the lead on the basic science. The, 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 the Japanese are also very good on the basic science. And then I would say the Chinese, uh, if you just watch the table of contents in Nature Biotechnology, it's not atypical in an average month for half the table of contents to be out of mainland PRC. Right? So it's very sophisticated biotechnology research now coming out of PRC. And when it comes to industrialization, I would say that PRC is ahead of US in terms of investment. Um, Although the private sector in the United States is where we're seeing the scale of investment um, begin to come up to, to match some of the sovereign investments in the, in the PRC. So Jason, I would, I would defer to you specifically in that regard. Um, with respect to the USG, um, synthetic biology has gone up and down. Um, it's up right now in part because when President Biden set up his administration, he put it in the same sentence as artificial intelligence. And in part, he did that because we have a pandemic and in part, the response to the pandemic involves DNA synthesis and synthetic RNA vaccines. And so suddenly you really couldn't hide from the reality anymore. Um, nevertheless, um, uh, we still have a lot of work ahead of us. And I, I would again, defer to others. Um, 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 you know, it's, it's like, we have, do we have AI.gov? Megan's long posed and asked the question, should we have a bio.gov? Um, we, we haven't yet seen an executive order on the bioeconomy to my knowledge. That's been lurking for 12 years now, 10 years now. Um, and, and, and so um, there are interagency working groups on synthetic biology uh, that, are, that are fruitful, but it's still, I would say, very much below the surface. Um, I'm not totally current on appropriations and with the recent legislation, what's showing up. Um, there's a possibility for movement there, but I suspect not, unless there's significant um, Advocacy. Um, to give you a, to, let me just give an example of a piece of a puzzle I would wish for in the United States. Uh, NIST, right, uh, out of the Department of Commerce that develops reference materials and, and helps with metrology and standards. They have a physical measurement laboratory, nation's timekeepers in Gila and Boulder, Colorado. Uh, they got a material measurement laboratory if you want a, a jar of standard peanut butter, right, you can buy that for 800 bucks or something. They don't have a, they have good people working in bio but it's not yet big enough. It's not yet ambitious enough. I'd love to see NIST have a bio measurement laboratory. 600 net new people working at NIST, half in Gaithersburg, half distributed you know, uh, throughout industry and academia. That's the type of, 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 of response of investment I would consider to be matching the opportunity and strategic. And, and we're very far from that, I would say. And even, well, we're, we're close enough that I can say those words, but in terms of getting that done and through the Congress, not yet, not yet there. And, and I'm again, really curious, Jason and, and Megan, and, and if you, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if you're willing, anybody wants to chime in. Yeah, I mean, I'd echo most of what Drew said. I think on the US government side, uh, from my perspective, the uh, like- Jason, could you, could you just quickly introduce yourself to folks who might not know you? Yeah. 
Sure. Uh, I'm Jason Kelly. Uh, I am uh, most notably uh, one of Drew's first graduate students back at MIT, uh, but also the co-founder and uh, CEO at Ginkgo Bioworks uh, based out in Boston. Um, and we are uh, uh, sort of a leading company in the space for kind of pushing that Moore's Law uh, function that Drew was talking about. Uh, I'd say that axis is the one we've worked the hardest on. So trying to essentially automate the laboratory work associated with synthetic biology to create a scale economic so that as as we do more of it, it gets better um, and, and try to create that flywheel. Uh, and then we, we offer our business models to offer it kind of like Amazon Web Services, like you can uh, kind of sign up to have access to our, our facility and, and make use of our scale on a service basis. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I would say at the U.S. government level, uh, I think, yeah, it's definitely on upswing, I, but the, uh, I think it's more driven by um, pandemic and biosecurity than like synthetic biology itself. Uh, but I do think like, like bio's on the mind and I don't think it's like not going to be on the mind. Uh, so, so I think it's right there. Uh, the, the other poll uh, for it, I think it will be the climate stuff. Um, so I think the particularly around like direct air capture, there, there is some of that in the new bill. And so that should, I think, trickle its way down to driving more SynBio. Um, I don't know if we'll ever see the fundamental stuff. I mean, um, you know, I think there there is the opening for like a, a kind of build a cell from scratch project that I think would be kind of the equivalent of a human genome project effort at, by the US government. I don't know the, if the appetite's there for that yet. Um, I do think, Drew, you mentioned like that people will frame it and, and economic because like frontier technologies are a dirty word. Uh, and I, I think I think the government can talk about frontier technologies, but it has to be basically in competition with China. Um, so uh, you, you know you could if you could get us in a in a space race uh, to a build a cell, I think I think that would uh, probably trigger the potential for a, a program there. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is, yeah, I, I would say for the last probably five years or so, there's been a big swing on the private sector side of SynBio. Um, you know, now in general growth, money has peeled off in the last six months, but um, ourselves and other, like we took our company public last year, raised a lot of money. So there, there's definitely a, a window where SynBio private sector, I think, has has some win in its sales for probably the next few years, at least. I'm happy to comment more on that if there's specific questions, but yeah. May, may I just add on a few things? Um, so three years ago, uh, there was a meeting of, uh, I think, 12 different countries that came together to present their bio roadmaps. Um, and I think at that time, there was about 36 or so different countries that had national strategies around, around the, the wording different bio, you know, sort of biotechnology, engineering biology, synthetic biology. It's interesting to see the dance in terms of how they, they frame them. Um, there's a, another meeting that's going to be occurring likely in December or possibly as late as February. Um, there's many more countries I would probably estimate around 60 that have sort of articulated. In terms of what organizations are, are leading, again, I think we talked about basic versus applied research, but it's also interesting to see the emergence of other organizational forms to support science and innovation for which biology is the motivating factor. Um, in the US seeing sort of um, uh, focused research organizations is sort of a new vehicle that's been developed, but also other types of international consortia. Um, I think there's still a, a, a difficulty in who's going to break symmetry in some of those and make the focused investments in foundational tools and technologies. So there's an opportunity there. Um, on the government policy, I, I think there are hopeful signs in um, in the U.S. and seeing uh, both in chips and science and in the <laughs> chips and science was the first time that. I think they did a find and replace potentially synthetic biology with the words engineering biology <laughs> instead. Um, but the fact that there was that part of the legislation that was kept, um, uh, you know, and there is uh, actually parts of um, synthetic biology and engineering biology that are throughout that um, chips and science bill, including biometrology within NIST, also within DOE and within um, NSF. Um, but the big question is whether or not we match by any sort of uh, appropriation. And so, uh, but I think the cultural significance of having it at least named as something that we think needs to be led on is significant. It, it will just require, um, frankly, like a, a, a leader to be in that organizing role, uh, Amy, as you mentioned, like there isn't the sort of charismatic leader that's based at OSTP or within one of the other agencies that was really driving um, the type of 
of, of building that you saw in um, uh, in in nano or or even now in quantum. Um, so that that's a big gap. Thank you. So uh, Herb Lynn is invisible, but he has a question. Herb, can you hear it? Yeah, thank you. Um, Ruth, that was a great talk. Um, I, I, I wanted to, to, to push you a, a, a little bit on your notion that um, bio is becoming bit. Um, and, and, and there's a sense in which, of course, that, 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 it, that is true. But eventually, it has to be instantiated as atoms. Uh, and and in, in that regard, I, I see SynBio as being, in some sense, related much more analogous to the 3D printer uh, as the, you know, as, as the in, as the instantiating device, uh, rather than uh, a computer uh, that you know the, the, that we all have on our, our laptops. And I observe that the penetration of 3D printers into, you know, the diffusion of that in, into uh, the end user space, you know, the, the you know, as, as individuals and so on, the personal ones that you're talking about, just really hasn't happened and doesn't seem likely to happen for a while, because stuff that you want to do in bulk uh, just isn't really feasible to print, you know, to, to, to print uh, locally. Um, just like if I want to make hundreds of copies of a book, I don't print it on my print on my local printer here. Although everybody can uh, can create a book on you know using their their own word processor, but they send it to a, a, a publisher. So I'm wondering how far down your uh, your your uh, how you know, down to the individual, how far down how far down that uh, that metaphor goes uh, before you 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 start uh, but before the revolutionary potential gets realized. Herb, thank you so much. That's a great question. And it reminds me to highlight, right? Like doing these comparisons between say 3D print and DNA print would be good to do. Um, um, so, so DNA print is 1D print. It's not 3D print. You're just making a line, making a polymer. And then once you make that polymer, you get all the benefit of what the biology does. So I'm not the first to observe that the ribosome is a programmable nano assembler that takes a 1D tape and then makes a one dimensional peptide that folds up into a protein that people like Jennifer are expert in engineering. So, so one thing to point out is that, that DNA print is a 1D print and it doesn't have, to, doesn't have to do more than that because then it gets everything that biology can do to the extent we know how to do that. Having said that, there actually is 3D print in biology. Our colleague, Mark Schuyler Scott, for example, over in the pediatric heart uh, research team is capable of taking actual 3D printers and printing cells as inks to make heart-like structures. Um, now that type of 3D printing for biology is grossly limited by the cost of materials and re resolution and all the limitations of 3D print. But I, I don't think those particular physical limitations apply to DNA print because that's a 1D print. Having said that, the DNA printers we have today are primarily industrial. And they are almost exclusively operated in factory-like settings that are accessed remotely through a web-based API. I will note in passing that the same was true for DNA synthesis, DNA sequencing, the reading of DNA, until enough money was organized, most notably through Oxford Nanopore, to make a pore-based sequencing technology, um, the MinION, it's called, and blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, you get a USB peripheral, you can attach it to your computer and you could sequence DNA where you are. Um, it's easy to imagine taking some of that technology and recombining it with the advances in enzymatic synthesis as opposed to chemical synthesis and get to a personal DNA printer. Um, I'm not saying that's trivial, but I, but I think you're right to point out the limits of 3D printing. And I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe some of the physical limits don't apply for DNA print. Okay, uh, quick question here. Yeah, I just, uh... I'm trying to understand the distinction in between synthetic biology and genetic engineering, because in my mind, they're still quite different things. And we're doing a startup, which is much more genetic engineering. So is it just that you're operating on single cell, a limited number of single cell things that you really understand extremely well? Or is, it, is there more to it than that? You know, th thank you, Mike, for the question. I would say, obviously, I'd argue there is more to it. Um, Stanford helps invent genetic engineering 50 years ago, and um, we don't make a department of genetic engineering. I think there's one department of genetic engineering in the world that I know of in Estonia. Um, 
So, so what, what I meant to highlight in the early slides around synthetic biology was some of the deeper engineering ideas, older engineering ideas of, of coordination of labor via standards, management of complexity via abstraction, and, and desegregation of workflows. These, these simple but more formal underlying engineering ideas that impact workflow, I think are what synthetic biology has brought to the practice of genetic engineering. Um, is the juice worth the squeeze? I think so. Um, I think eventually they merge. That kind of what you're yeah. saying. Well, and I think all of it, all of it exists with, under the umbrella of bioengineering, right? As a 21st century discipline, where at the core we're working with living matter to do useful things, right? So yeah. What well, I think I one more question, Elena. Thank you, John. I have. I was curious about Drew's thoughts on the following: that piece by Paul Antras that you drew, flashed a few minutes ago summarizes, I would say, some of the current thinking among economists uh, about the forces promoting globalization that economist fears are weakening because of their dramatic impact, uh, adverse impact on, on low-wage workers. I'm thinking about the effects of trade and offshoring on their employment. Um, that, that feeds back into, of course, the uh, very tricky politics very tricky implications on the policy and politics of trade in the United States. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions among economists in terms of what you see as, as I thought as a pessimistic view by Paul and where do you think are the greatest synergies between synthetic biologies and economics? Thank you. I hope David, you might chime in on this if willing, but, but I'll, I'll give a first uh, blush response. Um, I think a lot of people are still waking up to what biology can do. You know, for example, if you have a conversation in Washington about medicines, most of the starting position is medicines are made by chemistry and chemistry only. Even though half of our medicines are made through biology, right? From antibiotics to the natural products. Um, um, and, so, and so simply welcoming people into the conversation of what can be built with biology, helping them understand current practice let alone what could be, is, is an important first step. The next thing, my old housemate and, and colleague, Rob Carlson, has pointed this out for a long time. And Megan, maybe you can update us where this landed in, in the recent legislation. Um, the codes that economists use to track economic activity have traditionally not tracked biological activities as a contributing factor to the economy. And so Rob literally had to, by himself, begin to quantify what he called the bioeconomy. Right, along with Mary Maxson over the last decade. And that was incredibly helpful because it displaced terror as the leading narrative around what was happening in emerging biotech. So, so like how big is the genetically engineered gross domestic product? Right. And Rob was the first to quantify that. And people are now clocking it at about a trillion, is it about a trillion, almost a trillion a year of revenue domestically? Um, if I if I have that right. Um, with a doubling time of six to eight years historically, going back to 1980. Uh, within the recent legislation, is there a call to formalize this finally within what's at the NIAC codes? Is yeah, well, it, it's not that specific, but the um, Engineering Biology Research and Development Act does have a requirement to essentially measure the bioeconomy. The problem is there's not an effort to figure out what are the relevant metrics. I see the funding for those metrics really coming more from the Homeland Security uh, project order to figure out what is the bioeconomy that needs to be secured, um, but that doesn't necessarily enable many people to track. Um, but there, there is some in there. Of course, it's an unfunded mandate. So, um, yeah, but so, uh, uh, Elena, imagine you had 5% of the domestic economy that's bio-made, literally grown, yet we're not tracking it formally. Um, that's that's going to lead to all sorts of um, easily addressed, uh, well, low-hanging fruit that we could do a lot better. Yeah. I think that's going to be our next topic. So this is terrific, Drew. Thank you so much for enlightening us and giving us much to think about. We really appreciate it. So come back. Thank you.